last time. Uh, we talked about applications. of the computation of the fundamental group of S1, right? So we had uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, we had the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Um, which says that every self map of D2 has a fixed point. <clears throat> and then we did borsok ulam uh, which says that any map from S2 to R2 must identify uh, <clears throat> an antipodal pair of points. Uh, then we saw that uh, pi 1 of Sn is uh, 0 if n is greater than equal to so the trivial group. Um, and the point was that Sn minus any point <coughs> is contractible. And any uh, path, any loop, In, um, into Sn is homotopic <coughs> to a non-surjective map. Right, so after class, somebody was asking me, um, I said at some point uh, that using a compactness argument, you could see that there were only finitely many intervals uh, that you needed to modify, but I didn't tell you what the compactness argument was. Right, so uh, the point is that you pick a, any point on, uh, on Sn, and this inverse image is, of course, a closed subset of the unit interval, hence compact, right? And so we had, um, at this point in the proof, we had um, possibly infinitely many uh, intervals of, um, of the unit interval, subintervals of the unit interval that we uh, cared about, the ones that entered the ball. And well, because this is a compact subset, it only intersects finitely many of those. Right? So that's the compactness argument. And then you only need to modify f on those finitely many subintervals. Um, this is compact. OK, and then uh, we proved also that Rn is not homeomorphic. R2 if n is different from 2. That the fundamental group of a product is the product of the fundamental groups. And incidentally, that um, if you have a, uh, a homeomorphism, then the induced map is an isomorphism. OK, so that's what we did last time. Are there questions on last time? I, I did get a question uh, whether you could use, uh, I mentioned last class that all of these hold for uh, in higher dimensions, and whether it would be okay to use uh, the three-dimensional version of borsuk ulam on the homework. So if that's what you need to use, use it. Okay. Um, wonderful. So the first thing we want to do today is point out that um, the induced map between uh, fundamental groups. Um, so we know at the moment that the induced map is an isomorphism when you have a homeomorphism. But of course, these are homotopy classes of maps. 
So you would expect that you don't really need it to be a homeomorphism if you have a homotopy equivalence that should give you an equivalent, an isomorphism, right? And that's true. So let's start by seeing that. So first, a lemma, lemma. So let's say that you have a homotopy of maps between two spaces. And let H be the path in Y traced out by uh, the um, image of a base point. Uh, so we're going to send T to phi sub T of X naught. Um, so uh, let's make this H sub, uh, oh, terrible notation. Uh, uh, no, hold on. H. It was good. Okay. Um, so then we have the endpoints. Let's put up here v1. So here's the induced map of v1. We have the induced map. by phi zero, and we have this direction, the isomorphism given by changing the base point. Right? So the base points in these two cases, phi naught of x naught and phi one of x naught, are connected by a path. Right? That path is this one. Right? <coughs> and we know that whenever uh, you have two points connected by a path, the fundamental group with uh, those points as base points are isomorphic, right? In fact, every choice of path gives you an isomorphism between them, right? So the claim is that this commutes, right? So that's another way of saying that um, phi zero induces uh, the same thing as beta h induced with, uh, composed with the induced map of phi one. Okay, so another way of saying this is that Homotopic gap maps give you the same map as long as you identify the, um, the range groups so that you can compare them. Can you just, I, I, can you just uh, sort of explain what the maps are in the diagram that you drew? Sure. So, um, so remember, every time you have a, a continuous map between spaces, it induces a map on um, uh -huh. fundamental groups, right? By just taking a loop and composing it with this map to get a loop over here, right? But of course, if you compose with phi one, then you send the base point to phi one of x naught. And if you compose with phi naught, you send the base point to phi naught of x naught, right? However, there is an isomorphism between these groups, right? For every choice of path connecting the base points, there is an isomorphism, right? And remember that, that isomorphism corresponded to this picture. Right, so you give me a loop at uh, phi one of x naught. Right, this loop. I want the loop that starts at phi naught of x naught. So what I do is I start here, I walk over here, then I do the loop, and then I walk back. Right. So this is the path H, and that map is beta sub H. Okay. okay. Wonderful. So. So that's the lemma. So the proof is uh, we're going to just take any loop and uh, we're going to show that, so given any loop uh, in um, uh, pi 1 of x, x naught, uh, we want to show that phi naught composed with f, which is what we would get on the left-hand side, is the same as uh, is homotopic, uh, path homotopic, to beta h uh, composed with phi 1 composed with f. 
right? So if we show that this loop uh, is path homotopic to this loop, then we're done because uh, f was an arbitrary element here. Right, so that'll show that we've induced the same map on the fundamental group. What is on the left side? I just can't uh, Phi naught composed with f. All right, so this is the image of uh, f. Well, the homotopy class of this is the image of this class under this map. Gesundheit. OK, great. So remember, beta h is given by um, h dot v1 composed with f dot h bar, right? where this is the path h, and h bar is just the path going the other opposite direction. Uh, so we just want to put uh, sub t, sub t, sub t to g get a homotopy between them, right? So let h, uh, let's use s, we're already using t, uh, be the, uh, be, um, okay, so this is going to be a path from 0, 1 to y, be a reparametrization. of h restricted to 0, comma s. All right, i.e., h s of t is equal to h s t, for example. Uh, so then, um, H s dot phi s composed with f dot uh, h bar s. OK, so remember the way we constructed h was that at every t, you, you're at phi sub t of x naught, right? So that means that this concatenation makes sense, right? This path ends at phi sub s of uh, x naught, right? And that's exactly where, um, um, where this one ends. This one starts and ends where, um, where this one ends. Yes? The, um, on the like, left of where your finger is, what, that's equal to the right side of what you? Yes, this is equal to this, yeah, just by the definition of beta okay. h. OK, so this is a path homotopy. All right, so notice that h sub s always starts at uh, phi naught of x naught. And uh, because we go back, we also end there. So this is a path homotopy between, so if you plug in s equal to 0, you get the left-hand side. And if you plug in s equal to 1, you get uh, the right-hand side, beta h of v1 composed with f. OK. So now it's easy to see that if, um, if you have a homotopy equivalence, then the induced map for any choice of base point is an isomorphism. OK. So of course, this is what you would expect. That you don't need an, a homeomorphism because you're just dealing with homotopy classes. A homotopy equivalence is enough. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So for the proof, consider a um, a homotopy inverse. of phi, 
right? So that means that if you do uh, psi composed with phi, this is homotopic to the identity um, in x. And if you do phi composed with psi, this is homotopic to the identity in y. OK. So because this is homotopic to this, right? they induce the same maps up to some isomorphism. Right? So what we can say is that psi composed with phi, the induced map, is equal to beta h for some h. Right? I don't really care which one. All I care is that this is an isomorphism. Right? Uh, hence, it's an isomorphism um, from pi 1 of xx0 to pi 1 of x, and we've switched base points in principle. OK? OK, but really what I care about is, since this is an isomorphism, and we know that the composition, the induced map of a composition is the composition of the induced maps, right, then, well, if this is an isomorphism, then this, ma this map must be surjective. And this map must be injective. Right? And of course, the same thing is true if I switch the order, because that's also isomorphic, uh, homotopic to the identity. So phi star composed with psi star is an isomorphism. So phi star is uh, surjective. And psi star injective. Right? And so in particular, they're both isomorphisms. <coughs> sure, that's this lemma. Right? So um, take as your homotopy the one that goes from psi composed with phi to the identity, right? So uh, one of these, say this one, would be psi composed with phi, and this one would be the identity, right? So here I get psi composed with phi, and here I get the identity. So I just end up with beta h on this side. More questions? Right, here it's a homeomorphism, right? So that meant we had inverses that were equal to the identity on the nose, right? Here they're not equal to the identity, they're just homotopic to the identity. Okay, so the homotopy equivalent is actually weaker. That's right. Than having a homeomorphism. Exactly. Right, so for example, think of a, a, a contractible space, right? So you can take Rn and contract it to a point. Right, so the inclusion of a point is homotopy equivalence, but it's certainly not a homeomorphism. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, OK. So in particular, one, um, um, it's worth introducing notation for a uh, homotopy that fixes the um, uh, the base points. So, uh, you know, if if phi sub t is a homotopy and phi sub t of x naught is equal to y naught for all t, then we don't have to introduce this beta. Then we just have um, 
this map is equal to this map on the nose, um, mass maps. All right, so uh, we, we abbreviate this by saying that uh, phi sub t from x, x naught to y, y naught is a base point preserving. homotopy, right? If we're feeling lazy, we just write this and say it's a homotopy. And the notation indicates that for all t, you're mapping x naught to y naught, right? Um, similar lazy notation if we write that this is a homotopy, what we mean is that A is a subset of X, B is a subset of Y, phi sub T is a homotopy of maps from X to Y, and the image of A lands inside B for all T. All right, so, um, so this is convenient notation, especially later. Right now, we really use the, um, the case of a point. OK. <coughs> Wonderful. So, so, so far, we've been able to compute the, home, the fundamental group of a contractible set, so for example, a convex subset of, of Rn, and uh, the, home, the fundamental group of the circle and the fundamental group of a torus, because we know how to do the product of spaces. Right. So next we're going to see a, a really powerful tool that lets you compute lots of home, uh, fundamental groups. Right. So this is known as the Van Kampen theorem. Um, okay. So uh, Van Kampen was a Dutch mathematician at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Who, um, who moved to John, Johns Hopkins. And he was, uh, when he arrived, he was a professor there. When he arrived, um, Oscar Sariski, a famous algebraic geometer, was the visiting professor. And, um, and Sariski was trying to compute the fundamental groups of uh, the complements of surfaces. Right? Uh, surfaces are, are very natural uh, algebraic objects, as well as uh, manifolds and uh, topological uh, uh, objects. So, um, he had figured out some generators and some relations, but he couldn't figure out if, uh, if he had it all, right? If, if those were all of the generators and all of the relations. And, uh, and Van Kampen came up with a way of checking that he had everything, right? And so that's, uh, that's the theorem we're going to study. Uh, tragically, Van Kampen died when he was only 33 years old. And it's amazing the, the amount of things he managed to do before that. But, um, OK. So, Um, OK, so let's state a version of this. And then, um, so let's say that you have x, and you write it as a union of two uh, subsets with a and b open uh, and path connected. a and b open, and a, b, and a intersect b are path connected. Then, um, so I'll just write down the, um, the statement, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, then the fundamental group of x, uh, pick a point x0 that's inside the intersection, is equal to the free product of pi 1 of a and pi 1 of b, where you mod out um, by, um, well, let's state it like this, where you identify uh, elements of 
pi 1 of a and pi 1 of b if they are the image of the same element of pi 1 if a intersects b. OK, so the idea is you're going to construct um, pi 1 of x from the fundamental group of pi 1 of a and pi 1 of b by just taking the free product. So we'll talk about free product in a moment, but that just means you're just going to form words uh, out of uh, letters in pi 1 of a and pi 1 of b. Right? So you're just going to put them together formally. And the only relation between them is that uh, if an element of pi 1 of a comes from pi 1 of a intersect b, then you consider it as the same as the element of pi 1 of b that you get from that element of, of the intersection. Can you just say that one more time? Yeah. So we're going to have um, words consisting of loops in pi 1 of a and loops in pi 1 of b, right? So loops in a, loops in b, right? And the only relation between these loops is going to be that a loop that comes from pi 1 of a intersect b is going to give us the same element no matter which group we see it in, right? So, yes? Sure. One is this basically like quotient out by the a normal subgroup? It is, absolutely. And then I remember a similar theorem in manifolds for Durant cohomology. Um, are they related? So, y let's say morally, yes. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, so once we get to homology, uh, the corresponding thing is, is a, a long exact sequence in homology. So, so we can revisit that once, once we've gotten to that. Yeah. Uh, but certainly it, it, it is a, you know, a, a construction of, uh, of the homology of a space from pieces. Um, OK, so. Uh, great, so free products. So let me remind you about uh, free, free groups. Uh, so if, uh, if G1 and G2 are groups, their free product consists of words, so um, mm, so you're going to have uh, g sub 1 followed by g sub 2 followed by g sub 3. All right, so uh, just a finite um, word, so uh, sequence, finite sequence of uh, elements from one of the groups. So uh, each GI is in either G1 or G2. Right? And um, we can reduce a word uh, by <clears throat> Uh, doing uh, two operations. If, um, if g i and g i plus 1 are in the same group, then um, then we can replace g i star g i plus 1 with just the product inside the corresponding group. All right, so uh, g 1 star g 2. g n is uh, the same. as putting these two together.
Okay? So if you have uh, words, uh, letters next to each other that are in the same group, then you can just multiply them in that group. And uh, the second thing you can do is you can remove the identity. from either group. All right, so if I have something and then I have the identity in one of the groups, then I can just remove that. And I consider that the same word or a reduction of the same word. Right. Uh, so those are the uh, two ways of reducing. And um, this gives you a group. And in which the identity is the empty word. This yields a group. It has the following uh, key property, right? So there are obvious inclusions by just putting a, a word with a single letter, and that letter being elements of G1 in this case, or letters being elements of G2 in this case. And uh, if you have um, any group and um, phi i from g i to h are homomorphisms, uh, then there's an obvious extension. Um, from G1 star G2 to H um, extending V1 and V2. Right, so if you view G1 as sitting inside the free product and you evaluate capital Phi on that um, subset, you get V1, right? And if you evaluate capital Phi on G2, you get V2. Right? And of course, all you're doing is if you have the word um, then you just do phi, um, let's say phi um, L of 1 of G1 times phi L of 2 of G2 phi L of n of g n, where L of i is equal to 1 if g i is in g 1 and 2 if g i is in g 2. Right, and this product is taking place in H. Right? So you have an, an obvious way of, of taking a homomorphism from G1 to H and G1 from G2 to H and putting them together to a homomorphism from the free product. Right? And, and it turns out this property characterizes um, the free product. It's a universal property for this group. Um, so if you've never seen this before, then uh, look up the details in Hatcher. He goes through the proof that this is a group. So uh, associativity is uh, tedious. Um, but anyway, uh, I hope the, the construction is, is uh, intuitive. You're just putting elements of G1 following them by elements of G2. Right. So.
so in this case where we have two, two sets, so I should say that the Van Kampen theorem holds for more generally for an open cover of X by uh, path connected spaces as long as intersections are path connected. Um, so when we get around to proving it, I will state the, uh, the more general version. Uh, but for the moment, let's stick with, um, with the case of two uh, open subsets. So, uh, if, um, if we have C, uh, if we have C equal to the intersection, and we have, uh, say, the inclusion into A and the inclusion into B, and then these guys have uh, inclusions into X, then <clears throat> if I have a, well, then this gives us, of course, an induced map of fundamental groups. For so remember, we pick a base point that's in the intersection, and so it's in all of these. So uh, let n be the smallest normal subgroup <clears throat> of uh, the um, free product. star uh, classic gamma inverse for all <clears throat> elements here. Van Kampen says that the fundamental group of X is the free product mod out by the normal subgroup. Okay. So this says exactly what I just erased, that uh, we're just taking the free product, and then we're identifying uh, a loop um, if it's, um, we're identifying an element here and here if it comes from the same element in the intersection. Okay, so b before uh, doing applications, uh, let me just um, there is a, a way of, of viewing um, this statement in, in a more uh, well at least stating it more categorically, right? So uh, this diagram uh, is special in that uh, you can think of this as saying x is built up from A and B by identifying the images of C, All right? So uh, that's called a, um, a push-out in set. So C, A, B, X is a 
push out in set because x is equal to the disjoint union of a and b where you identify, uh, so it was i1, i2, j1, j2. You identify um, j1, i1 of uh, x is uh, the same as j2, i2 of x. Right? So it's an identification space. Uh, take uh, a and b and then glue them together by identifying any point, um, oh, I guess without j's. Any point uh, in, uh, in C, uh, identify its image in A with its image in B, and that gives you X. Uh, so and what we're claiming over here is that um, <coughs> is that the corresponding statement of fundamental groups holds. So this diagram is a push out in groups. Right? So without going into what push out means in general, uh, let's just say that it's saying the same thing as this. Uh, you have pi 1 of x is equal to, instead of disjoint union, you take free product. <clears throat> and instead of saying this, what we're saying is uh, we're just going to identify, so mod out, we're going to identify i1 star of gamma <coughs> is, if you like, equal to, well, say so we're modding out by identifying this with i2 star of gamma. Right? So this is the smallest space you get by taking a and b and then identifying um, things that come from c. And this is the smallest group you get by taking a and b disjointly, so the free product, and then identifying things that uh, come from the same element in, in pi 1 of c. OK. But you don't have to worry about this. This is all you need to know. All right, but there is a categorical way of thinking about it. OK, so we're going to put off the proof of Van Kampen and focus on uh, what we can compute with it. OK, so for example, let's say that x is a bouquet of two circles. <clears throat> OK, so we have two circles identified. Uh, we pick one point from each one and identify those points. OK, so we need to construct an open cover of uh, path-connected sets with path-connected intersection. Right? So um, we want them all to contain the base point, and the base point is going to be the distinguished point. So what we can do is take A to be that, take uh, B to be that, so that the intersection looks like this. Right? OK. So A, B, and A intersect B are path connected. So the fundamental group of X is the fundamental group of A, free product fundamental group of B, mod out by this normal subgroup. Right? But in this case, the normal subgroup is things that come from 
uh, the fundamental group of C, C is uh, contractible, right? So C is contractible. So N is trivial, right? So I'm going to um, use 1 for the trivial group instead of 0 for the trivial group, hopefully without causing confusion. Can you explain why C being contractible means that the normal subgroup is just going to be trivial? Sure. So in this diagram, uh, this is the trivial subgroup, right? So what we want to do is take the free product and identify everything that in pi 1 of A with something in pi 1 of B if they come from the same element of pi 1 of C. But pi 1 of C only has the identity. So all you're doing is identifying the identity in A with the identity in B. And that doesn't change the free product at all because you're, we can reduce by removing the identity. So we're not doing anything. Right? So it's just a free product. Right. So uh, typical notation is to say f of a, b, where let's say this is a and this is b. Right. This notation means the free group on two generators, and here are the generators. Okay. Van Kampen gives us a very quick proof of um, of the fundamental group of the spheres that we had to work uh, hard for before. Um, so consider a sphere. <clears throat> so look at an equator and take A to be the top hemisphere and go a little bit over, and B to be the southern hemisphere, but you go a little bit over. So that the intersection um, is not empty, and it is it's just a little tube around um, a little strip around the equator. Okay, so A and B are uh, homeomorphic to uh, n-dimensional disks, right? And uh, this is a convex subset of Rn. Or if you like, there are contractible sets, subsets of the sphere. Right? If, if you're only looking at uh, the upper hemisphere plus a little bit, you can contract that to the North Pole. And the Southern Hemisphere plus a little bit, you can contract to the South Pole. Right? So a contractible set, so in this case, pi 1 of A and pi 1 of B are both the trivial set. Right? So if we can apply Van Kampen, we're going to get uh, the trivial set mod out by a normal subset. Right, well, that's going to be the trivial set. Right, so the only question is, can we apply Van Kampen? So we, the hypothesis, we need A, B, and A intersect B to be open and path connected. All right, so we just need, these are uh, path connected. We just need this to be path connected. Right? And as long as n is greater than or equal to 2, In fact, if and only if this is path connected. Right? Because obviously, if you did this for S1, right, you would have uh, this interval and then this interval, and the intersection would be these two intervals, which is not a path connected set. Right? So for S1, this doesn't work. Right? But as long as n is 2 or greater, then it works. So then Van Kampen 
tells us that the fundamental group of Sn is the free group of the trivial group cross the trivial group mod some normal subgroup, and that is, regardless of what the normal subgroup is, the trivial group. What is the normal subgroup? Well, because it's the, tri the, the upstairs is the trivial group, n can only be the trivial group, oh, okay. right? But, uh, but if you like, what's going on is here you have uh, a, a, um, an Sn minus 1, right? So for example, if we were doing n equals 2, then this is an S1. And we know that S1 has non-trivial uh, right. homotopy group, right? Okay. But what happens is when you look at the image of uh, this loop inside A, you can contract it to the North Pole, so it's trivial. And when you look at the image of this, any non-trivial loop here in the southern hemisphere, you can contract it to the south pole, so it's trivial, right? So even though A intersect B has non-trivial fundamental group, okay. its image in the fundamental group of A or the fundamental group of B is trivial. Okay. Do you pretty much only use this theorem when this n is going to be trivial? No. Or, okay. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, generally all, all three things occurring are going to be non-trivial. But the first two examples have trivial. OK, um, let's look at uh, the torus. Right, of course, we already know how to compute the fundamental group of the torus, because it's just S1 cross S1. Uh, but let's compute it using its, um, its identification space. Right, which we talked about when we were talking about cell complexes. Right, so the torus is just a rectangle with opposite sides identified. Right, so it includes the interior. And remember that uh, all four edges correspond to the same point. Right, so you have some point here, and all four vertices correspond to the same point. And then you have one loop, say that one is A, and then you have some loop like that is B. Okay, so we want an open cover uh, of path connected sets, right? So okay, we're going to use this as our vertex, right? So this is going to be the um, the base point, and. Um, <clears throat> So what we can do is for A, pick some um, disk in the center and take everything outside of that. Right. So that's A. Uh, for B, um, pick something that goes like this. So it includes this, right? So I, I, I want to cover. So now I need to include the center, that disk that I removed, I want to include the base point, right? So just in, in larger open sets, so it includes the base point. Of course, all of these points are the same, so that means it actually extends out like that. Right? So make that B. Of course, this is all in the identification space. Uh, no. Thank you. OK, so what does that leave? For C, OK, well, here's the set that we had for B. And for A, we removed this disk. So C is going to be all of the parts of B that don't have that disk. OK? So there's our open cover. And A, B, and C are path connected. Right? So we can apply Van Kampen. So we need to figure out uh, pi 1. And then what is the image of pi 1 of c inside pi 1 of a and pi 1 of b? 
Okay, so space. A, uh, I can um, do a deformation retraction and just move everything out to, to the boundary of the square. Right? So just push everybody out to the boundary. And uh, A is homotopic to um, the wedge of two circles. Right? Because the boundary of the torus is just this wedge of two circles. It's the one skeleton of the cell complex. Right? B is homotopic to a point. Right? B is contractible. And C, well, C is just an annulus. Right? An annulus you can retract, home, deformation retract to, to any circle. Right? Um, so C is homotopic to S1. Right? So we know the fundamental groups. So pi 1 of A is um, the free product of Z and C, but importantly, it's the free group on generators A and B. Um, pi 1 of B is trivial, and pi 1 of C is the integers, uh, which you can think of as the free group on a single generator. Let's call that generator gamma. And uh, gamma is, um, here, let's put it in this picture. That's gamma. All right, so it's a loop inside this annulus. Well, of course, gamma should be based at here. So it's really something like that. So it has the right base point. OK, great. So the free product, so the Van Kampen tells us that it's going to be pi 1 of A times pi 1 of B divided by the normal subgroup. Right? Pi 1 of B is trivial. So we just have pi 1 of A divided by the normal subgroup. Right? So the normal subgroup is the image of pi 1 of C inside pi 1 of A. So that's what we need to figure out. Right? So let me write that so far. So Van Kampen tells us that pi 1 of x, in this case the torus, is, well, first of all, pi 1 of A, free product pi 1 of B mod out by the normal subgroup. But here, that's just pi 1 of A. And the normal subgroup is just the image of pi 1 of uh, C inside pi 1 of A. Right? And even better, uh, that's the free group on AB. And we're modding out by the free group on gamma. Well, the image of the free group on gamma. OK? So what I want to do is write gamma in terms of A and B. So what is gamma in terms of A and B? Exactly right. right. So if you look at C inside A, if you look at gamma inside A, then it, it deforms onto the boundary, and it goes all the way around the boundary once. Right? So then you can just read it off. It does A, it does B, it does A inverse, and it does B inverse. Right? So um, gamma in pi 1 of A represents A, B, A inverse, B inverse. <clears throat> All right, so 
here we have the free group on AB, and we mod out by the normal subgroup generated by AB, A inverse, B inverse. OK, this sort of thing happens a lot, so we have special notation for this. We write the group generated by AB subject to this relation. Right? So this is common notation. You write the generators. And then you write the relations. Right? So really, I mean this is equal to 1. So I could write this out as a, a, B, a inverse b inverse equals 1. But usually, you leave out the equals 1 and just write the relation. And there's an implicit equals 1. Right? And if you have more than one relation, you just add them there. Okay. Now, in this case, if you have the free group on A and B, but A, B, A inverse, B inverse is equal to 1, right? Now, I could also write this, equally good notation, uh, by moving some of this to the other side. So this just says A, B equals B, A. So I have the free group on two generators. Subject 2, they commute. Right? So that's just C2. Or if you like, it's the free abelian group on two generators. Which, of course, is the answer we got before. Right? Luckily. <laughs> OK, questions on this? All right, so this is what most of the computations you do with this look like. You end up with a, a presentation of a group, it's called. Right? Every group has a presentation, not necessarily finite. Right? But you can always write a group as some generators and then the relations between them. OK, let's do another case like this. Um, slightly faster this time, since we know how it's going to work. But let's say you have uh, the, um, a surface of genus 2. Well, let's say orientable, to be clear. Right. So we talked about the identification space for this guy as well. It's a stop sign. With a, B, A, B, C, D. C, D, right? And so if you have some base point here, then A corresponds to a loop around this hole like that. Say B corresponds to a loop around this hole like that. And then C and D do the same thing around this hole. OK? So it's the, the stop sign with its interior. OK? So we're going to play the exact same game. So remove a disk and call the exterior A. Take an open set containing that. Call that B, right? Then the intersection C, and these are all path connected. A is homotopic to a bouquet, but now of uh, four circles. A 
OK, they should only be touching in one point. Let's see. Right, A, B, C, D. B is contractible, it's homotopic to a point. Yeah, it's the, the same idea. I've removed this disk, and so now I can take uh, this whole thing and just uh, deform it to the boundary. Right? So it ends up just being this boundary. But remember that this boundary is an identification space, right? So uh, all of these points, all of the vertices get mapped to the same base point. Right? So I just end up with, with four loops right, with common vertex. Then B is contractible. And C is uh, homotopic to a circle, right? Let's make space and include in here gamma. So S1, um, so to a single loop gamma. So pi 1 of A, by the same reasoning, is going to be the free group on A, B, C, D. Right? So if you have a bouquet of, of um, circles, the fundamental group is just a free group with one generator per, per loop. Uh, pi 1 of B is trivial. Pi 1 of C is the free group generated by gamma. Right? Um, pi 1 of X is well, by Van Kampen, pi 1 of a times pi 1 of b divided by n. But because b is trivial, this pi 1 of a divided by the image, uh, well, the normal subgroup generated by the image of pi 1 of c in pi 1 of a. <clears throat> and um, uh, gamma. represents what loop does gamma represent in the fundamental group of A? A, B, A, which is the first C, B, C, and first C. Exactly right. right. So you just take gamma, and in A, it goes all the way to the boundary. So you just go around the boundary. right? So this represents A, B, A inverse, B inverse, times C, D, C inverse, D inverse, pi 1 of A. <clears throat> so, pi 1 of x is the free group on a, b, c, d, mod out by the smallest normal subgroup containing this word, right? which we present like this. Right? So it's a free group A, B, C, D. And the only relation between the letters is that if you have this product of commutators, it's equal to 1. Okay, So it's great in the sense that we, we computed the fundamental group. There it is. Right? It's, it's perhaps a little less satisfying than the previous one because we can't just say, oh, well, it's our favorite group, c squared. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not a, an abelian group, for example. Right? Um, so in particular, um, if you want to compare them, you could say, well, OK, this is not abelian. That one is abelian. So then they're different. Right? Another thing you could do is abelianize this one. Right? So take this group and then mod out by all commutators. Right? So note the abelianization. Um, so 
g goes to g divided by its commutator subgroup of uh, pi 1 of x uh, is the free abelian group on four generators, right? So this is easy to see because if I make this abelian, if I just declare that a, b, c, and d are now going to commute, then uh, this relation doesn't add anything, right? So I just get the free abelian group with no relations, right? So that's c to the 4. OK, now isomorphic groups have isomorphic abelianizations. So from here, we see clearly that uh, this group is not the same as the group of the torus. Right? So this implies since C4 is not congruent to C2, um, the torus with one hole is not homotopy equivalent to the torus with two holes. Um, OK. Um, yes? So what's the intuition that the two-hole torus is not uh, the fundamental group that's not commutative? Or sorry, the? Uh, yeah, so. Um, well, really, what's, what should be surprising is that the fundamental group of the torus is commutative, right? That's a surprising thing. So, uh, so if you like, it's, um, you know, when you're looking at a bouquet, then there's absolutely no relation between the different loops. So if I do A, and then I do B, and then I come back and do A inverse, there's no reason for those A's to cancel, right? Because you did B in between, and there's, there's nothing mediating between them, right? Now, in the case of the torus, you're exactly gluing in, I've erased the picture, but uh, you're exactly gluing in the, um, uh, the inside of uh, A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So you're, you're, you're taking that particular word and you're saying this word is trivial, right? So perfect, you've made them commute, right? But when you're looking at the two-hole torus, you're starting out with these four loops that have no relation between them at all, and you're adding in a single relation, right? That relation is the interior of this loop. So you're just declaring this loop is trivial. Right? And that loop is the product of the commutators. Right? So um, yeah. So in general, the fundamental group is going to be non-commutative. Non it's, it's you know, strange and beautiful that it was commutative in that case, but uh, generally not. More questions? So, so in the torus case, just a single hole torus, if I have a loop that goes into the gonad hole and then one that goes around, uh -huh. I can deform that into what we're saying is we can go into the gonad hole first and then go around. Uh -huh. In the two hole torus, we couldn't do that? That's correct. Okay. They would not be equivalent loops. Uh, so actually, it's one of the homework problems to, uh, <laughs> right? One of the homework problems says precisely, you know, we know that uh, the fundamental group of a product of spaces is the product of the fundamental groups, right? Not the free product, the, the Cartesian product, if you like, right? So in particular, that means that they commute. And so you're supposed to construct a homotopy showing this commutativity, right? And if you like, you should think about the torus as, uh, as a way where you can do this, uh, in, where you can see what you're doing, and then try to get the proof to work in general. OK. <clears throat> How are we doing for time? Okay. So this, um, the, these two examples are uh, cell complexes. And in general, uh, the Van Kampen theorem is really good at telling you how to compute the fundamental group of uh, cell complexes. And in fact, it's, um, it's exactly what we saw in these examples, that the one skeleton 
is going to give you your generators. And the two skeleton is going to give you relations between your generators. And it turns out you don't care about anything higher. For the fundamental group, all that matters is the one skeleton and the two skeleton. Okay, so cell complexes. So let's say X uh, is a cell complex. Right, remember these are also called CW complexes. <clears throat> and um, denote its K skeleton. So here's a proposition. Um, the natural map between the one skeleton and X, so this is just the inclusion of the one skeleton inside X, induces a map here which is uh, surjective and if you look at the two skeleton then this is an isomorphism. Okay, So all of the relations come from the two cells. Okay, so we'll prove something very similar, um, but slightly more general. So just take Y is a space obtained from another uh, which we assume is path connected by attaching a collection of two cells by the attaching maps um, phi alpha. So. Nine thirty-two eleven. Oh, class over, right? Okay. So uh, perfect. So uh, I'll finish stating this. Uh, no, I won't. I'll finish stating it next time.